So today I'm going to show you what we call makeovers. Like you can make over by giving person a makeup and change the appearance of a person. In the same way, bonsai are showpieces. You grow bonsai because you love them for the beauty. For nothing else, you can't eat it, you can't do anything with it. You like it because they're beautiful. So the more beautiful the tree, uh, the more enjoyment you get from it. I'm often asked what makes a bonsai more valuable or more expensive, if you think of monetary terms, than another bonsai. And that always boils down to the sheer beauty of the tree, nothing else. It's not the age or anything, it is just the beauty of the tree that matters. So if the bonsai is more beautiful, it is not just more valuable, we shouldn't always think of it in monetary terms, but monetary terms is a common denominator by which you can measure relative uh, goodness or beauty or whatever you may like to define the concept of value to be. But anyway, so the beauty is the be all and end all of a bonsai. So I have today several trees, I may deal with about five trees, these are what we call commercial bonsai. They usually come from Japan, from exports which are produced like this, mass produced. And of course, your object is to improve them and to make them even more beautiful. I always feel that almost every bonsai can be improved upon. There's no such thing as a perfect tree. Even if you create something which is beautiful, Someone else will have an input and say you can make it even more beautiful. I'm not now looking at the negative side where people make comments because they're jealous. And sometimes they want to make comments because they feel that it makes them more knowledgeable or whatever. I have always uh, never you know, stopped telling the story of, I think it was an exhibition back in 1991 in Birmingham when there was a big bonsai exhibition in Britain. And it was a large exhibition with many trees. And there was a beautiful group of trident maples with must have been more than 50 or 60 trees in it. Not very old trident. They were very thin trident maples. Probably the trees weren't more than seven or eight years old. But it was a beautiful group. The group was so beautiful that you could just stand back and admire it in awe. But what did I find there? I was standing in between, uh, behind two guys who were obviously from some club or other, and they were discussing between themselves uh, the merits and demerits of the tree. And all they were looking for is looking for faults. And in the end, after standing behind them for about three or four minutes, one of them piped up and said to the other, you know, this tree or this group has a lot of faults, and the main fault is that it's got 48, either 48 or 56 trees he had counted. He took the trouble to count every tree. He said, 48 or 56 trees, it is an even number. It is 40. It is 40. He didn't look at the positive side to say how beautiful tree that group was. As you know, I have this theory that once a group exceeds the number seven or nine, you can't distinguish between odd and even numbers. But anyway, he tried to show how clever he was, a clever dicky, that he counted 46 trees, so that group was faulty. So you get people like that. So my object always, when I uh, am asked to give a view, is that always look for the positive things in a tree. Don't always look for negative. But having said that, you can always find room for improvement but look for improvement in a positive way, not in a negative way. Now, let's look at this tree. What are the positives of this tree? This is trident maple. The, this, the positive is that it's a very healthy tree. It's got a beautiful trunk with beautiful base there. Taper is maybe not so brilliant because it's got inverse taper. There's a big lump there. That was, that is a very severe fault. You know, if a uh, you know, critic would look at it, it's very severe fault. There's a lump there, so, you know, that would mark it down. But the overall shape is good. So the positives are it's got a thick trunk, good spread of root base, and a nice overall shape. So let me look at the 
so-called areas of improvement. I'm not going to look for negatives. I'm going to look for areas of improvement. The first thing I would like to comment about this is that there are too many branches here which is clouding the front of the tree. So you can't see the trunk. So let's remove some of these branches in the front which are blocking the view of the trunk. As we always say, if you've got it, flaunt it. Why hide it? If you've got something nice to show, show it off. Don't hide it. So, let us show it off by revealing the trunk. Just by removing a few leaves, you can now see the beauty of the trunk. Let's keep it like that. Okay, so that's nice. Also, let's try and create some space between the branches. Don't let it grow into each other. I think we can maybe also improve it by a bit of wiring to create spaces. The back side, I'm not too worried about. But also, having said that, sometimes the back side can become the front side. So the nebari on this side is also exquisite. So although this is actually the back, it may end up as the front. Why do I say it is the back? Because this tree is leaning slightly towards us. So that is why my initial reaction is that this is the front. But looking at the nebari again, or the root base, if you look at this and memorize it, look at this and memorize it, I would tend to feel that this is a better, better root base. So, I have my cameraman Shomo in front of me. What do you think? Which do you prefer? This one. This side, there you are. It's more even, beautiful spread. First is also very yeah, easy. and that root is not so ugly. Looking at it from this side, See, this is ugly. This is too prominent. So if you use this as the front, this is too prominent. This doesn't make it look so good. But if you turn it around this side, this side, the nibari looks very, very good like that. So if I wanted to make it tilt, I can always tilt it forward slightly. So the leaning is not that important. So straight away, I have more or less changed my concept of what was the front and what is the back. So I took all that trouble to remove those branches from the front. Now I'm going to remove the branches from this side, which was the back. Let's do it gradually and see what happens. Okay, I'm not being too drastic. I've removed that much. And let's see what is happening now. You see how some severe chops have been made to create a better taper. So this is how bonsai is actually made. A lot of people, I read on some of these comments on my YouTube uh, channel that they have said that very often uh, they disagree with certain views. And of course, there's always Sometimes a good reason, sometimes a bad reason. But anyway, uh, I think we're getting a bit lost now. Yeah, they were saying that about creating taper. They said that all good bonsai are not created by chopping a tree. I don't think you can create a decent bonsai without chopping. The taper is only created by chopping. So that's not too bad. Also, these defects can be improved by carving. If you carve it and make it a hollow trunk tree, it would look even more interesting. Now this is also one some people would regard as a very serious defect because it's such a thick lump over there and that might look odd. But again, in my old age, I'm coming around to the view that what often constitutes the conventional wisdom is not always necessarily correct. There are different views 
and different concepts of beauty and what you might think of as beautiful, someone else may not think as beautiful. So you've got to respect people's views. Okay, this could be improved on by paring it down slightly, make it look less prominent. But that in itself is quite a beautiful feature. You do find trees growing like that in nature, where they're gnarled and old looking. So people are always influenced by the convention that all trees have got to look like these perfect Japanese or Chinese trees and to hell with it, you know. They very seldom uh, have the feeling or the empathy that good trees should be like trees in nature. In fact, sometimes bonsai can be so perfect, to use uh, that term, that they almost look plastic. And plastic, I mean, it is manicured to perfection, and they no longer look natural. So I wouldn't be too bothered about that. That might be quite nice. And because I come from a commercial uh, background where I'm having to sell trees for a living, I've learned to respect people's tastes. Over the years, I've come to realize that what you may like is not necessarily what other people would like. And what you don't like is sometimes what other people like. So respecting people's tastes is very important. So I will leave that for now. I've at least opened the tree out so that you can appreciate the beauty of that trunk. Now let's go a little further up the trunk. These are just trimmed hard into a ball shape and nothing else is done to it. But I think to make it look more beautiful, we need to open up a little more. I'm not going to open up everything because we always refer to the, like the dance of the seven veils. For those of you who don't know, the dance of seven veils, like when, you know, these people who dance, belly dancers and all and other dancers, they put a veil in front of their face. And, you know, the mystery of that in itself is fascinating, makes it more mysterious, more beautiful. So having a little bit hidden from view adds to the mystery and beauty of the trees. So I've opened it out a little bit. So you can see I've created very gentle tearing over there. And again, the top I think I need to thin it out a little bit. You notice I'm only using my secateurs. I'm not using any sophisticated bonsai tools. That's all you need. I'm thinning it a little bit to let light in. If you let light in, the tree grows better. I'm not scalping it entirely bald. So there you are. That's all I've done to the tree. For my money, I like that expression, for my money, this would be better in a rectangular pot or even a shallower drum pot. I don't have any pot to hand, but I will in a minute. So let's get it out of the pot. Now, this would look probably better in a pot something of this size, if you can just visualize the tree. And I think that would improve it quite considerably. So the pot would make a considerable difference to that tree. Just by transferring the pot, it changes the look. Also, if you want a drum pot, maybe a slightly bigger drum, that could also fit there. And my colleague here, Shomo, was just asking me, can we repot maples at this time of the year? Now, we are now in the third week in May, 
and this tree is in full growth. And you can see that the roots are very vigorous. And this is not the right time to cut any root, but if I just simply rearrange the roots, if I just rearrange the roots, tease it out, don't cut any roots, I can easily put it in that pot and the tree will not suffer at all. I can assure you that. So this is how I have improved that tree. So I, I'm sure you will agree that this makes a better impression or gives a much better feel to the tree. So once you look at the tree, the overall feeling, that doesn't bother me. I don't need a thin branch. That is a beautiful feature in its own right because it's a defect. A defect has become nice. This again, if I can just teach you something about wabi-sabi. One of the important aspects of wabi-sabi, people mention wabi-sabi uh, like chalk and cheese or whatever, but they don't know what the meaning of wabi-sabi is. But wabi-sabi, one of the important elements of wabi-sabi is the beauty of imperfection. This is what we're talking about. No one in life and nothing in life is perfect. And the beauty of imperfection is that it has a beauty of its own. It, something can be imperfect and yet beautiful, and that is a case in point. That is imperfect, but it is beautiful because it adds character to the tree. Okay, so let's so move on to another tree. Again, we have maples, and this is an ordinary mountain maple, straight Acer palmatum. The green trees are the ones that have the best autumn color. So this, is a tree that we could have easily grown in our fields. In fact, we have loads of these trees in our field. But this happens to be one of the trees that are imported from Japan, as they are. And of course, they come from uh, Japan, potted up, and they're just a triangular shape with a lot of foliage. And most people would give the right arm for a tree like this. Quite a mature tree but so many possibilities and there are so many aspects that you can look at and improve on. Looking at this, this tree, I can see straight away if it was my tree, I could make it a shorter tree, this short and remove the top. Let me just bring my famous white bag and just show you what I mean. You could easily take off that part of the tree and then you have a beautiful tree below there. You can make a short tree, air layer it and get another tree from there. So that's a possibility. Uh, now let's look at this tree again critically and see what we can do with this tree. Again, the first impression that it's full tree, very healthy, lots of foliage, but nothing else. For most people, they would give their right arm, as I say, for this tree, and they would be quite happy with this tree. But for a connoisseur, there are many uh, aspects which could be improved upon. So how can we improve upon? I'm not going to do the drastic, which is to alienate the tree and get a short bonsai from it. I will keep it as it is for now, unless I am persuaded otherwise. I could easily do it. It'll only take me six weeks to get new roots from the top and I'll get a nice small tree at the bottom. But let's see how we go along. I never plan anything in advance. I just work with the flow and see what emerges. That is my style of working. I like to work in that way. Now, I haven't decided which is the front or which is the back, but if I were to look at the nabari or the root base, this root base there, is quite interesting. This is also quite interesting like that. And we could open the tree out this way. In fact, this tree has got so many other possibilities I've just seen. Because this tree has just been allowed to grow, you don't even need all that part you could keep the tree that tall as well. It could still look quite nice. It could still look quite nice. I mean, earlier that top part, you get a nice short bonsai. 
and make this the leader. See, this is going upward. That could become a nice leader. You've got branches there, got branches there. So I might well do that. I might well do that. Uh, I'm not doing it just for the sake of doing it. I'm doing it for a good purpose. In bonsai, there are people who do things just for the sake of doing it. I'm rambling on, but I'm just giving you the benefit of my experience. Because we sell bonsai to customers, I have found very often that people, when they buy a tree, they can't leave it alone. Their hands are itching to get on the tree. The first thing they do, they take the tree out and they repot the tree. And when the tree suffers and dies or doesn't recover well, they said, uh, the tree is not growing well. So I quiz them and ask them, did you do anything to the tree? Then with a lot of inquisition, they will finally admit, oh yes, I repotted the tree. So I asked them, why did you repot the tree? No, they say, say, I don't know. I felt I had to do it. I said, why do you think it had to be done? He said, because everyone tells me I've got to repot the tree. So things uh, like that they do. So don't repot if you don't need to repot. Uh, so it's things like that. So same thing, you know, get a tree, they've got to cut it up. But I'm going to do some pruning because I want to improve the look of the tree. Okay, so what's uh, not so good about the tree? There's too much foliage hiding the trunk. We always emphasize showing the trunk. Because bonsai is about trees, if you don't see the trunk like that, it's a bush. This is just a bush. It's not really a tree. Now, to make it look like a tree, we need to remove some of these branches that are hiding the trunk. This is hiding the trunk. Get that off. I know that if you're new to bonsai, don't do it if you don't know what you're doing. Very dangerous. So I've started showing a bit of the trunk. See, just that little bit has made a difference. There's a lot of density there. Now this branch is sticking up, it's doing nothing. Let's get rid of it. I keep looking at this side because this more or less strikes me as being a better front than the other side. This other side, there's so many branches sticking out there. I have to remove a lot of it to make it more credible as a front. So I'm not See, even this is jutting out, so for that reason, this is not a plausible front. See, I've thinned it. Always remember that with Japanese maples, the image of Japanese maple bonsai is always of a very delicate tree. I have referred to this uh, image of like beautiful women or beautiful models. Traditionally, Japanese maples have always been regarded as feminine trees. Amazing how in the space of one decade, in the last 10 years, sexism and all that has become so prominent that people are afraid of mentioning the word, you know, male and female. 
because of the equality of sexes and the gender equality issue. But there's no getting away from the fact that women are regarded as beautiful and men are regarded as uh, another type of image. So the image of the Japanese maple in bonsai terms, especially in Japanese society, has always been to regard maples as being feminine trees, delicate and beautiful, whereas the pines are meant to be macho and strong and powerful. You can't get away from it. Pardon me if you think I'm big sexist, but that is how bonsai and the species are regarded. Okay, so in order to create a beautiful image with a maple bonsai, you always have to bear that in mind and make it very delicate looking. See, see how delicate the branches are. There's nothing powerful and strong about it, but delicate beauty. So that is what the maple image should be uh, cultivated uh, to being. Okay, so that is what you are always trying to aim for in a maple bonsai. Delicacy and beauty. So I've already opened it out a little bit. I said a moment ago that the tree doesn't need to be that tall. If, if you feel that this is too tall a bonsai, then I could easily, let me bring the bag again, terminate the tree here. And that would be a more, I think, pleasing height. That means we would take that off or air lay that bit. So that is how uh, this could be treated. But OK, what if I didn't air lay it or take it off? Let me just see. Simply by reducing the crown, I might get a more interesting image. Don't forget, after all, I have to sell this tree. So if I have to keep air layering everything, I will never see the end product. So practicality often dictates what one has to do in life. Of course, we are just entering the summer period. So there's going to be lots of new growth. So I don't have to worry about not getting enough growth. There's going to be plenty growth. So this is what this tree is now looking like. So for this tree, again, this pot is going in a deep pot. I would just say something about deep pots. When trees are being trained, they do much better in deep pots. They don't dry out so well. It gives it a lot of root space to grow. But I could change it into this pot. If you look at it from low level, that would suit it. And with maples, I always like to use glazed pots because the autumn color is nice. That, again, is only tradition. If you wanted to use an unglazed pot, you're perfectly uh, at liberty to do so. But maples, because they have lovely autumn uh, hues, they always look better in glazed pots. So that is what we do traditionally. So that low branch there, that access the back branch. You've got enough back branches there. And the front is quite open. So this is the future of this tree. So we're going to put it in this. I will do it in the next few days and show you the end result. So that is the pot for this one. So we finished with another project. Let's look at yet a few more. So we have number three. This is the third maple. Again, Asa Palmatum, or what we call simply Yama Mobiji. And it's been potted, as you can see, in an unglazed, rectangular, sh shallower pot. But this tree has a very obvious defect. I think it was chopped at some stage recently. You can see the cut there. I think the grower must have felt it was too tall, so they cut it there, or it could have broken. You never know. And it's left it with this new leader trying to struggle up to grow into a more interesting shape. So this tree, although the branches are quite well spaced, not brilliantly spaced, so this is the condition of the tree. 
if we look at the base, the base is interesting, but again has some defects. And a big defect is this ugly root here. That root, if we need to hide it, we can cut this off because you can't make it radial anymore. So cut that off and let it spread this way or hide it in some way or grow it into a turtle back. But that root doesn't do the tree any good. And the obvious front, hard to tell. I won't chop any more branches in case I need it and change it at a later stage. So looking at this tree, what one needs to do straight away is fill this space here. It's got no obvious uh, crown, what we call a crown. So if you can just borrow some fake leaves and see what it would look like if it did have a crown. It's something you can do. Supposing we added something like that. See, that is what the tree should look like. But you can't get that growing overnight. It takes time to develop and grow. So what I could do is to bend this down this way and grow it and keep encouraging that top to grow. So there's no instant solution, as it were. But what we can do is that the overall shape is a bit heavy around the middle there. It's almost like what we call a midriff bulge. So let's correct that a little bit and make it more of a conical shape. By doing that, we might improve it slightly and keep control of it. Also by doing this, we're going to send all the energy up the tree. Remember that in the growing season, you can always thin the tree by just plucking the leaves. If you pluck the leaves, you encourage more budding in the inner twigs. The line of that tree is quite interesting, the curve there. It's obviously wired from young. Looking at the tree, I've just spotted something, if you can spot it. You look at the tree this way, that is very straight, okay? That trunk is very straight. If I turn it here, what do we see there? That trunk is very curly there. So, you know, there is a case of making this the front of the tree. So the more you look, the more you find. So I may have stumbled across the solution of the tree without really trying that hard. So why look further? Why try and grow a new crown? Let me just change the front. I was put off because the tree had been planted in a pot like this and it threw me off scent. But this really is not as good a front as this. So I will correct it straight away. I'm going to open it up and make this the front. Look at it. I've got a ready-made leader there. How about that? It's made my day. And I can just take this to the side a little bit, take this to the side a little bit, and then develop the tree that way. I could use this as a sacrificial to thicken the trunk. I might use a thick piece of wire to take this branch this side. I will just do that. Because in another of my videos, I showed how I wire maples. Because maples don't like to be marked, we do what is called very light open coil wiring. That means we don't wrap the wire tight. We just put it very lightly on the trunk, just to direct it in the right uh, direction of growth. 
So, for those of you who are inexperienced, please remember that maples are very, very brittle, very brittle. And you could easily snap a twig if you're not careful. They can break very easily. So maples are generally not wired. They're only wired when they're very, very young. Now that, okay, if I'm using this different, I don't need this. Don't need this. Look at the beautiful S shape there. I think whoever potted this maple had made a mistake. This should be the front, not that. And okay, let's open the tree up even more. Okay, I'm going to pot the tree up this way. I'm going to do some carving. There you are. Solution changed. Change the tree. So the tree is going to end up like this. I can't wait to pot it with this as the front. So I've solved that one. This is number four tree. We've dealt with three already, the trident maple and the two mountain maples. Now what have we got here? This is a Japanese hornbeam, what they call uh, the Laxiflora, Carpinus Laxiflora. They've got beautiful flowers and they seed very easily. And this obviously has been grown from young, so there are no severe cuts to it. So the taper of both the trees are very nice. I mentioned both the trees because although it's a twin trunk, this is obviously made by putting two trees together when young. Very seldom will you get a tree which grows twin trunk like that. So you can see that it is two trees joined together to make a twin trunk. It's very common practice, especially with maples and deciduous trees like hornbeam, even zelkova. It is made in that way. So the first thing I look at this tree when I analyze it, it's the overall shape. It's very pleasing, a bit overgrown. And now I've got to decide which is the better side, which is the front, which is the back. Uh, I love the styrations. This is called styrations, these vertical lines, wavy lines on the trunk. So that's very beautiful. And looking at it from this side, and then looking at it again from this side, I would think the other side is the better side. This is the better side. Okay. Nothing really defective in this tree except that this is leaning a bit. I think it's a bit overgrown. Many people are afraid of pruning. Okay, now that it's what we call late spring, I can still do a lot of pruning. So what we say, bite the bullet. If you didn't prune it, see already in the space of a month, I've had growth that long, four to six inches long. This is the old money. I don't know what is it, 20 centimeters growth in the last few weeks. So we need to remove some of that. Otherwise, it'll become too top heavy if you didn't do it. I think this Felco secretors is better than the bonsai tool. Many people are afraid of pruning, but at the other extreme, I also find people who are so trigger happy or scissor happy that they prune everything and they make the tree bald. So, I think it's always best to strike a happy medium. Just do in moderation. As with everything in life, do in moderation. Be very careful, you know, with these tools. If you're not careful, you slice your finger. I've done it many times.
This is almost like a leaf pruning or leaf cutting. In the middle of summer, if you just reduce the density by doing this. I find that beech trees and hornbeams, they smell of roses in the spring. They have a lovely fragrance, the leaves, not the flowers, just the fragrance of the leaves. I dare say that the winter image of this tree would be very nice. Very delicate tree. Again, with most deciduous trees, the delicacy of the trees makes them attractive. Really delicate, you know, beautiful lines. And again, because I run a commercial nursery, I know that what appeals to one person may not appeal to someone else. But this tree, I would say, is very much a connoisseur's tree. It is so delicate, really delicately balanced. If anything, I would like to wire that up a little bit, but no matter. That's all I would do to it. And as the new shoots grow, I will keep pruning it so that I get more ramification from here, inside there. Because at the moment, all the ramification is happening at the top because the previous owners have not bothered to keep on top of this tree. So that's all I would do to this, nothing more. I don't want to go too mad. You can prune it much harder, but I think this is sufficient. Otherwise, I end up with nothing. So you don't want to get into that situation. So that's all I would do to this one. Okay, so this is an easy one. So here's the trident finally potted up in that oval pot that I selected. And in fact, this tree had my colleagues fooled. I asked one of my guys to pot it up and he used the other side as the front. He thought this was the front. Well, I don't think this is such a nice front. I prefer the other side as the front. So let's turn it around again. This was my preferred front because I like the Nibari better. And this lump, which I thought was ugly, actually is quite a nice feature. So here's this tree. Think what you will, but this is how it's turned out. So this is the maple where I suddenly discovered that having the front this side gives me a more sinuous look to the trunk. You can see how there's a slight gentle curve, whereas the original front, which was this way, the leader wasn't visible and the trunk was too straight. So by simply turning it around 90 degrees, we have a very satisfactory situation. And now I can build the apex uh, very nicely and pretty soon I should get a nice looking maple. So I hope those little exercises in aesthetics helps you to create better maples.